Good afternoon, good evening if you're in Europe. Um, it's delight I'm delighted to be here today. My name is Diana Fox Carney. I'm your moderator for this hour's discussion. Uh, it's great pleasure to have you with us for this, our second in our series, our three part series, our zero carbon future, making the transition just. So in our first webinar, if, if you were able to join that, we talked about energy poverty and how people would be able to, at, at, at a household level, how they would be able to manage the potential costs and cost fluctuations associated with the move to a cleaner economy. In this event today, we're going to focus more on the employment opportunities, uh, both for those who have worked in, in old economy industries, so those who work in the fossil fuels uh, area, how they're gonna navigate the transition and what kind of supports they're gonna be required and we'd also like to talk, think about uh, those who've been excluded from that workforce, but may have opportunities in the new environment. So this is not just about sort of working with a group who were doing well, may not do well, and need to do well again. This is about making this uh, a just transition for all uh, workers throughout the economy. So I'm really delighted to be here today with you. I think it's a really important issue, crucial we need to get this right if we're gonna maintain support for the transition. I just wanted to start today with a, a, a land acknowledgement. I myself today am in Glasgow, Scotland, attending the COP26 uh, climate conference. I've stepped out of that to, to join this webinar. But on behalf of Corporate Nights, the co-host of this event, uh, I would like to make a land acknowledgement. Corporate Nights is located in Toronto um, and with our partners, the German and French embassies in Canada, we honor the people and land of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Corporate Knights acknowledges the land that they are on is the traditional territory of many nations and is now home to diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Corporate Knights also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the credit. Uh, thank you for that. So we're going to start, as I mentioned, we are co-hosting with uh, the German and French embassies. Last time we had an introduction from the German side. This time I'm delighted to welcome um, Ambassador Queen Rispal, uh, the French uh, ambassador in Ottawa, to uh, open the event. Thank you very much, Diana, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you again for this uh, second climate talk. Um, so the subject today is living non behind and uh, how can the clean energy transition provide new opportunities for energy suppliers and workers. So Diana, you are in Glasgow, so at the COP26, it's a big, big moment. And we are all hoping for strong and tangible commitments. And um, uh, I think it makes uh, even more sense to focus on one of the most sensitive uh, but essential issues, which is a just transition. Um, we all know that uh, the G20 this week made a, a commitment uh, uh, towards limiting the global temperature incre increase to 1.5 degrees. But uh, of course, we know that it will require uh, a major change in our energy consumption patterns and uh, restructur restructuring of the sector. Um, it's true that uh, Canada, Germany, and France have all delivered ambitious announcements uh, on this matter. But it's true that um, if we want uh, to achieve our, our goals and, and to make our goals understood by everyone and supported by the population, we must protect the most uh, vulnerable against this uh, transition potential impact because uh, as you know, um, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people who will be uh, impacted by this transition, low-income groups, uh, the poor urban neighborhoods, um, residents of uh, rural and remote areas, 
Um, and all these people probably um, are lacking the know-how and, um, and they are probably at risk of uh, uh, displacement in declining role of industries. And that must be supported and, uh, and accompanied. So um, we will uh, need to ensure that uh, uh, energy uh, justice uh, for all will be provided in terms of accessibility and cost. Um, our president of uh, the Republic, Emmanuel Macron, uh, reminded us uh, in Glasgow that uh, the clean energy transition must be fair, must be socially supported, and it has to create new opportunities. And I must acknowledge uh, two big announcements made by the EU. Uh, the first one is a just transition fund uh, worth nearly 20 billion euros. Uh, to support the countries and the regions most dependent on uh, fossil fuel. Uh, but there is additionally another uh, announcement that has been made by the European Commission, and it is a creation of a 70 billion euro uh, European Social Climate Fund. And this fund is really to support those hardest uh, hit by the Fit for 55 reform which aim, as you know, to reach the EU 2030 climate targets. Um, I don't want to, to be a, too, too long, so um, I think today it's our responsibility to share best practices. Um, and I would like to thank our panelists for being here and uh, to share their thoughts about this very, very important subject, which is uh, the fair transition. And without further ado, um, I give the floor to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. That was a great introduction. I will say from Glasgow, there have been a plethora of these really exciting announcements, but there's also a great awareness that we have to move directly from the announcement into action. There's no time to sort of sit and wait and feel pleased with ourselves about announcements. We really have to move and that goes for, you know, these social transition funds as, as well as all the many other actions. The other point that I think is really relevant to this conversation is, is a shift in a lot of the dialogue to a focus on resilience. Now, there was a, a a concern that if we talked about resilience, we'd be accepting climate change for a long time. We would not be doing sufficient to mitigate. There is now, I think, a more realistic understanding that we have to mitigate, but we also have to ensure resilience. And that resilience is physical resilience against the ravages of the climate, but it's also very much social resilience. And it's, that's exactly what we're talking about today, to make this work for people, to ensure they have robust livelihoods, their vulnerabilities are, are not heightened by the undertaking that we, we have to make to uh, really survive and prosper going forward. So enough from me, enough color commentary from Glasgow. Let me move on to the panelists. We have three great panelists with us today. Um, and uh, I believe Chris is spreading up a slide, but possibly not. So um, we have from France, we have Catherine Bertrand, and she is uh, from uh, the Nord Pas de Calais in France, and she's the general manager of Mission Bassin Minier. And I will ask Catherine in due course to explain what that is, uh, or share, share really how that geography affects what she does. Uh, we also have Torben Albrecht, who is director of policy at IG Metal. Uh, he was previously uh, a state secretary, which for Canadians is, is equivalent to a deputy minister of labor in the German government. So he has that angle covered. Uh, and we have Matt Jameson, president and CEO, uh, the Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, located uh, just near Hamilton in Ontario. So uh, each panelist can tell us a little bit more about themselves when they join. I'm gonna pass uh, to Catherine at the start. Thank you, Catherine. Hello. First, I'd like to thank you for your invitation. I'm going to share my screen if it's possible. Yes, it is. Thank you. So my name is Catherine Bertram. I'm the Directly Manager of a public agency, the Mission Bassin Minier created in 2000 by interministerial uh, decision as a task force for the urban regeneration and sustainable development of the former coal mining area 
in northern France. And since uh, 12, uh, 2012, the mission is the official manager of the prestigious World Heritage label we obtained for Caulfield Heritage. So, I'm going to. Sorry, I cannot change my my slides. It may be it's my fault. Yes, it is. It was my fault. <laughs> so uh, this slide shows you our 100 kilometer long segment of the coal vein running around the planet from the Appalachians to northern China. The coal mining production lasted nearly 300 years in our region from 1720, donc, uh, King Louis XV, the other job near the Belgian border, it started there, and still 1.2 million inhabitants work and live here. It stopped in 1990 in the region. As a whole, 2 billion tons of coal have been extracted, which sounds quite modest today if you compare with the, you know, the modern productions. You see how close we are to the rural, uh, to rural area, rural beat, and uh, it's, also, it's a worldwide history, but also a European history, of course. Coal mining activity tells us about an extraordinary social and cultural story the story of men and women of 29 different nationalities who came to work and live here. Throughout the world, industrial areas have many things in common, work, social struggles and strikes, disasters, 1,099 victims in the 1906, the catastrophe de courrier can be, uh, can be reminded, and a specific sociability and immigration. But digging the coal in the coal field grew more and more expensive in the, in, the, in the 50s in comparison with other European and world producers. It was also painful, the coal vein being deep and steep. You had to dig one kilometer uh, in, a, in, a, in the center of, a, of, of, the, uh, of the earth. So it was quite deep and steep. 1960 was a turning point the government took the strategic decision to change energetic policy in favor of petrol and nuclear power. The decline of coal started with two major plans, the plan Janonet, 1960, and the plan Betancourt in 1968. And the, the end of the coal mining activity was planned for 90, 1985, it was in 1990. This survey realized 1969, which was the peak of coal mining activity shows you the gigantic scope and diversity of the properties the company, the national company, used to own and manage in the North Calais, from the tips, from the, uh, from the, of course, uh, the, uh, the railway tracks, the housing estates, the pumps, and of course, all what was connected to uh, the life of the miners from, uh, from the church, sports, schools, and, and so on, from birth to death. So in fact, if you look back, reconversion is a very long story. And the end of coal mining leaves short-term and long-term impacts on landscapes, cities, men and women. In the 80s, with the decline of the mono-industrial activity, leaving the territory with low financial resources, the mining basin was an economically devastated region with very high rate of unemployment. We lost. 220,000 jobs within a few years, which sounds quite dramatic in the context of mono industry, because we were in a mono industry, small, a small part of the basin was concerned by steel industry, which it is a very pure mono industry. So in fact, as a whole, despite many efforts and positive results, the coal fields was stigmatized for decades. Slight changes of its image became tangible recently. We've got two powerful in engines in the dynamics of change and search for economic models and just transition. How come brownfield, former brownfields can become industrial heritage and recognized as world heritage, evolving cultural landscape in 2012? And also how the trajectory of the coal field, cradle of the first industrial revolution, can be targeted to the third industrial revolution, inspired by Jeremy Rifkin's theory based on synergy between renewable energies and internet technologies. This is not biometric, 
the actual state of conservation protection of coffee heritage is the result of 40 year regeneration policies. In the slide, there's three steps of the brownfield regeneration from the 70s to today. From experiments to massive and quantitative regeneration to more holistic development, economic reconversion, and uh, strategy, uh, holistic development strategy and projects. The same difficult exercise in, within one slide concerning policies, programs, and tools applied to economic reconversion and job creation. It combines specific European national regional aids and tools for economic reconversion since the 1960s and job creation. So we've, I've got all the list of uh, the creation of jobs because we lost 220,000 jobs in a few years, but some jobs, of course, were created. But it was not up to the expectancies of uh, completely fulfilling uh, the, uh, the, loss of, the loss of jobs. But many, uh, in fact, national tools, so also for coffee industry, industry funds, also enormous, uh, an enormous uh, and massive funds from the EU, uh, from the EU, uh, from uh, the IERDF, which is uh, very important for us, European uh, uh, Region uh, Development uh, Fund, uh, and also the Social uh, European Fund, which is very important for, for us. Structural funds have played an enormous uh, role in the reconstruction, regeneration of, uh, of the coal field. You also had, before 19, 19, uh, 1983, the decentralization, massive national government plans with, which settled uh, new industries. So in the black banana of uh, the coal field, you've got plastics, food industry, logistics, environment, car industry, uh, land transportation and digital industries, which were implanted uh, mostly car industry in the, in the 70s. And in 2006, maybe you can draw a line with this end of specific reconversion tools the prominent role of the regional council in, uh, in uh, regional, development, regional development and new dynamics of territorial development too. So the strategies that are played uh, are, are done and implemented by uh, local authorities too. But the state is never, uh, is never absent from this conversion. We've got a new program, interministerial, interministerial program called the commitment for the renewal of the mining basin. So, I would like to zoom to finish on a local tool, which is interesting. Uh, that's um, in fact a concrete tool of the uh, application of the, the Jeremy Rifkin master plan called REF3, uh, the third industrial revolution. It's called the recovery and ecological transition contract. And it's zoomed on the on Artois metropolitan area, which covers in fact the central and the western part of the, uh, the black banana of the, of the coal field. And it is uh, interesting because it's really an integrated territorial transitional strategy because the, this area wants, wishes to be a demonstrator of this uh, third re industrial revolution. It's three uh, shared strategic orientations uh, are combined uh, to in fact offer the necessary components of a just transition. And we've got three examples of uh, the first orientation as the eco-transition as a redevelopment model the first plan, plant in France of electric batteries for car industry, Gazonor, the capture of mine gas, escaping naturally from mine galleries and transform into green electricity and heat, new ways of, um, of mobility, uh, first line of 100% hydrogen and 100% made in France bus, and also a new a plan of uh, diversified indication and training offer through local university. So in fact, as a, as a conclusion, I would say that uh, it's a, it would be too simple to sketch this 40 year trajectory as a line, a chronology with clear and successive steps and milestones. Reconversion is a complex process and on this book, but the chapters are not numerated. It's a, it's a, I didn't give a numero uh, of a number of this on the, on the, in this open book uh, on, uh, on reconversion. It's made of superimposed policies of short-term and long-term issues. The result sometimes is paradoxical as the remaining gap between a good rate of job creation and a still high rate of unemployment. It means that local people do not benefit from the creation of new jobs, which is one explanation. And the discrepancy between the training education system and employers' needs. So the coal mining social and economic framework during 300 years shaped the community from birth to death 
They were made to be employees and workers. It can be understandable that you cannot press a button and have a spontaneous generation of startup entrepreneurs. I hope I won't I have been be too long. I'm finished. Thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine. That it's really fascinating to hear such a concentrated case study. And we can get back into some of those issues later on when we've heard from the other panelists. Just for context for, for, for the Canadian audience, I'd like to point out that we have at present about 160,000 jobs in the oil and gas industry across the whole of Canada. So Catherine was talking about 220,000 jobs uh, that were at threat in a very small region. So that will give you a little context. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on now to Torben Albrecht. Torben, are you there? I'm there. Thank you very much for the invitation. Should I start right away? That would be perfect. Okay, maybe for those of you who don't know the organization I'm coming from, IG Metall is a labor union in Germany representing more than 2 million workers in different sectors from the steel industry, a lot working in automotive industry, machine, but also ICT and um, workers of all skills levels too. So of course we here in our union, but as well as all um, unions in Germany are looking very much at the transition we're facing um, when we're talking about a transition into a green economy. And Catherine, I think made it very clear what this means for a region, what this means for workers. And I think we have to really have in mind when we talk about decarbonizing our economies that we are talking about a whole range of sectors. We are talking about the sectors that are phasing out, like the coal mining, um, and uh, then we have a lot of uh, sectors in transition, like the energy production, for example, but also sectors like the steel industry, if they want to go to green steel, that's uh, a long and uh, not easy way to go. And of course, products are changing too. If we talk about the automotive uh, industry, uh, we are going from combustion engine powered um, vehicles to electric uh, powered uh, vehicles. So I think a lot, the whole range of industrial sectors really is affected. And for us, it's important that we try to keep as many industrial jobs as possible. And if jobs are lost, and there will be jobs lost, um, then make sure that new industrial jobs are created and that the working conditions there are right. And I think Therefore, we really need active policies for addressed transition. And um, let me just highlighting three um, policy areas I see and that are three preconditions for me for just transition. The first one is investments. We need a lot of private uh, investments by corporations, but I'm sure that if we want to achieve a just transition, we also need public uh, investments and the now incoming new German government, in the first paper they published, they talked about a decade of investments to uh, make sure that the transition is working. Um, why do we need um, this public support? One reason is that we really have to look at the regions and Catherine, um, has presented a good example. We cannot just talk about jobs disappearing and then new jobs being created somewhere else, um, <clears throat> even not in a uh, different region of our country, but also not in a, a different uh, region of the world, of course. Um, but also, I'm sure that, and, and I'm convinced that um, if we, we cannot leave this all to markets only, if we only talk about raising prices for <clears throat> um, no clean uh, energies, um, this will not solve the, pr uh, the, the problem. And we have seen in Germany years of investing into renewable energies, but still we are much too slow. When we talk about um, clean energy for all sectors, for transport, for steel, for chemicals, we need a huge um, increase in the speed of um, providing clean energy. So investment is one issue. The second issue, and crucial for workers are issues around qualifications, either to keep the job you're having or to find a new job. 
And thus in Germany, um, over the last years, we moved from an active labor market policy where you help unemployed with qualifications to what we called a proactive labor market policy. Why should an unemployment insurance only kick in if a person is already unemployed? Why not start earlier on when people are still on the job? Uh, we started some projects there, and I think this is the right direction, and we have to go on there to um, provide people with the necessary skills or adding to their skills uh, to find uh, new jobs or to keep their jobs that are changing. So that is the second issue I want to talk about. And the third issue I think that is crucial for many dimensions is to um, let workers have a say in the transitions. Because we, um, this transition is not only a merely technical one, changing from one technology to the other, but it's also about keeping people aboard and having support for this kind of transitions, which people might fear because they have to change their way of life. They have to change the way they're working. And this can be much more easy if workers really have a say uh, when it comes to these changes. And in Germany, we are lucky that we can build on a strong tradition that workers' representatives in companies, the so-called works councils, they already have a say when it comes to certain issues. <clears throat> and uh, we argue that they should have even more to say when it comes to issues like qualifications, like I've been talking about. Um, and additionally to the, the works councils having a say, we also have a system where <clears throat> workers' representatives on supervisory boards um, we have in our companies also have a say. And they are members of the supervisory boards of the companies. And there, of course, we can influence also strategic uh, decisions by corporations, investment decisions. Um, and I think that is also very important to make sure that workers' interests are um, in the picture when we talk about this huge transition, the huge changes we're facing. Maybe so much from my side from the beginning. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Lots to talk about later on, but let's let's move to Matt now. Matt, are you there? Can you join us? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, thanks everybody Great. for having the opportunity to share my thoughts. A little bit about uh, my, my company. We're the Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation. We're the economic arm of what is Canada's largest and most populated indigenous community. We're located just uh, about one hour west of, of Toronto, the great, the GTA area. Uh, and you know, the whole concept of you know, the zero carbon uh, future and the just transition is, is really something that we can as a society latch onto because that sort of thinking aligns really well with the values that we have as indigenous people and our focus on sustainability and only taking what you need to protect the future generations so that they have what they need. Um, and and you know, anything that has a, a focus of sustainability and, and a focus on a cleaner environment are things that easily fit within the wheelhouse of, of, uh, of our strategy. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, making the transition, I think for us, it's a little bit different uh, for, you know, Canada does have a, a dark history with its indigenous people. And for many years, indigenous communities and members were considered wards of the state. And we were treated as, and we were treated as that. Uh, and so over the, over the evolution of time, and really starting in, in 2009 with respect to the Green Energy Act in Ontario, uh, we started to see communities being positioned to participate in the economy in ways that had never happened before. Uh, you know, we, we have been here for thousands of years and we've watched everything get built around us with, with participation or input or any, real, any dialogue or consultation. And so over the course of the last several decades, there's been this evolutionary switch in, in, in public policy and Supreme Court rulings that require governments and proponents to engage and consult in it with indigenous communities on projects that are gonna affect their lands and rights. And it's through those types of narratives, we're starting to unlock opportunity for indigenous communities like Six Nations, who are actually participating in the economy and in, in participating in the development activities in and around our territory. And so starting in 2009, the Six Nations Development Corporation were, were very much focused on how do we how do we position ourselves as, a, as an effective counterparty to activate these opportunities, to create wealth, to build capacity and put our people to work? And, 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 and it's been you know, a, a very, very um, steep learning curve for us 
to go from you know an economy that was really dependent on government transfer payments to now a thriving co- economy that has an economic might that we can influence public policy. And really that's the future, that's the destiny of what we're pursuing as, as a society here. Uh, you know, so now through the evolution of the last several, over the last uh, 10 years or so, you know, we have become a very aggressive investor in renewable energy technologies. We are an investor in transmission assets that, that crisscross our traditional territory. And we are in, in now uh, an investor in emerging technologies like uh, uh, battery storage solutions. And through those types of narratives and, and discussions with developers as well as uh, the system operator, we're able to identify gaps in in the system that uh, you know don't work for emerging technologies. For example, battery storage uh, it, it fills a gap. You know, renewable energy is great, but it's intermittent power, and and when it's not being utilized, it's unfortunately lost. So, battery storage is a key activating ingredient in my mind to maximizing the utility of renewable energy assets. And the grid that we live in right now hasn't really found a way to unlock those opportunities. And so part of what we're working on is working with innovative those types of solutions. And all the while staying focused on really the vertical integration of the things that we can do. So as an investor in a battery farm, as an example, uh, we're not only an investor, but we are also mobilizing our workforce. We have joint venture partnerships with some of Canada's largest public traded companies. And we are putting our people to work, actually constructing and operating these assets in the future. To me, that, that's economic development. That's what indigenous economic development is about. And we need public policy uh, to continue to, uh, to fuel that type of growth because you know, indigenous economic development is good for everyone. It helps the economy be, become independent. It helps the economy build pride. It helps those people go to work every day and, and put food on the table. But it also alleviates some pressure off government funding transfers and tax base. So for us, uh, we think it's a win-win solution. We're very, very proud of the things that we've done and the trajectory that we're on. And, and you know, the new energy economy for us has many more opportunities to be much more inclusive of an indigenous economy and indigenous partners. And that, that goes by way of asset ownership to the construction, to the operation, through building capacity. And you know, when any economy generates wealth, that wealth gets reinvested in that economy and there's economic spinoff and other emerging mer- um, market opportunities that can also grow from that. So it's exciting times for us. It's a, it's a transition. We're making sure it's a just transition and ultimately the, the whole zero carbon future is something that we, that we think uh, is non-negotiable. It, it, it has to happen and, and we're here uh, to, to advance that mission. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, that, uh, so much, Matt. That was really inspiring. We had a comment in the chat. We need to all follow your example. Um, no, I think I, I think what you've done is really clearly outlined the opportunities of the new economy uh, and for, for, for parts of society to participate in ways they didn't previously. So this is this is a, a good way forward. There is there there are two things I pulled out. I mean, there's lots to talk about here, but two two points that uh, came across very clearly to me. The first was this issue of engagement, and and Matt, you you talked about how important it is to to be at the table, and how once you got at the table, you could do more, and that that builds on itself. And also, Torben, um, we heard about the the different position, obviously, of unions and labour within the German industry. That is reasonably unique to Germany, or we we, we admire Germany for that. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Catherine, whether you have a similar level of or type of forum for local engagement as you've uh, charted the way forward in the Nord Pas de Calais. Yes, in, indeed. Uh, in fact, it, it depends uh, um, on the on the on the field you, you you're talking about. Uh, in, of course, in uh, for instance, for uh, the change uh, in um, in fact in a landscape in having a, going from the black archipelago to the to the green archipelago it means new ways of mobility building uh, new transportation ways and so on there are strong associations of uh, of people of users uh, who which who really uh, want a change in uh, in the landscape in the way of uh, of uh, moving uh, of uh, I mean, uh, it's a it's a new uh, citizen. In fact, a need that is, that can be observed 
in many uh, many areas uh, uh, of uh, of the world in the in the protection of heritage we've got some of course uh, some ngos associations which uh, really were uh, who very active in uh, saying that uh, in the just transition culture and uh, is very important uh, the access to training to education and to culture for us, uh, the World Heritage Label was really a symbol uh, in, uh, obtained in 2012. And also, uh, when the decision was taken at the, 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 the national level to build a Louvre, a new Louvre, uh, in, uh, in a form of pit uh, in the heart of the coal field in, in Lens. Uh, please come if you uh, come to our place. The Louvre, Lens, Louvre in Paris is, is quite, quite well, but the Louvre in Lens is really, really great. So it's a, it's a great symbol because many, many of uh, the visitors of the Louvre are local people, regional people, people who didn't have a, a full access to a museum, what a museum was, to what, what, to, to what art uh, represented. Uh, so it's a really a success in terms of, of uh, ownership of, uh, of the territory. Uh, in terms also uh, of uh, new forms of uh, eco-transition, there's a, a good example. It's called the mine of uh, ah, sun, sun mine, uh, mine de soleil. Uh, inhabitants are uh, in fact uh, participate to the capital of uh, of this uh, this uh, company exploita uh, exploiting uh, sun power. So it's uh, also a way of uh, original way to also to uh, open the capital of uh, of a company to uh, to inhabitants. Uh, so yeah, there's many examples. Uh, I can I cannot tell you now about uh, uh, labor forces in terms of uh, coal miners because uh, you, under you understood that uh, 1990 it was the end of uh, of uh, coal mining and uh, now the uh, the coal pact which was a pact co signed by uh, the national mining company and the trade unions worked well in terms of uh, of uh, reconversion of uh, the uh, of the the the, the miners. But as I, as, I told, as I told you, uh, all the new industries or the, these, all these efforts uh, didn't produce full uh, successes in terms of uh, job creation to replace the, the lost jobs. So we are not painting, uh, uh, you know, a drawing uh, or uh, a painting with uh, pink, pink colors. Yeah, it couldn't, it couldn't be just. It couldn't be just. Right. No, I think. Uh, that's absolutely, I mean, that's, that's good to remind us of that because obviously, you know, the success, but you've also lost things uh, and it hasn't worked for everyone. And even within these communities, it doesn't work equally well for everyone. Um, the, the other key point that obviously is critical to all of you is, is policy and the role of policy uh, around uh, lots of things, but you, most of you mentioned training uh, and skills uh, and how the public sector can support the development of the right skills. There's also questions around uh, the way businesses develop and, and, and the extent to which policy can encourage new types of businesses, I incentivize or, or create uh, new types of businesses. So I would love to, I mean, I'm sure you all have things to say, say about this, but I'm just gonna go first just to Matt here. Uh, and if you can describe how much you felt was sort of either done for you or in partnership with you and how much you really just had to do it yourself and you saw the opportunity and you you did this sort of training and the skills development and saw the business opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Diana. You know, we we as a community, you know, we've 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 watched everything be, be constructed around us for so long. Uh, having this strong desire to be part of the economy, but not really part of the narrative. And, and you know, so when the when the Green Energy Act came out in Ontario in 2009, we, we thought, our chief and council thought, this is, this is one of those rare opportunities that align with our values and we need to be part of this. How do we get in front of this as quickly as possible? Of course, you know, the, inter the independent power producers out in the marketplace have a, have a deep history and knowledge. So we believe that we needed to align ourselves with with power producers who who fit with our values, and and so we were able to do that uh, with a, with a few large companies incentivized to come into Ontario through public policy, through the feed-in tariff program, and and you know, ultimately that led to partnerships opportunity partnership opportunity. Um, but you know there's an there's an equal obligation here. You know we 
we can pound our we can pound our hand on the table and 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 want to be partners, but we have a responsibility to build the the right corporate structure to be a good counterparty to with the right governance uh, to actually be successful in a partnership. So we took that responsibility on, and that's where the Six Nations Development Corporation really came from. It does have the governance structure and the linkages to the community to act in that capacity. So we've we've done a, a tremendous amount of work here uh, to, to to pivot our community away from somewhat of a of somewhat of a level of dependency into more of a, the pursuit of autonomy is really what it's all about. We want to be an autonomous government. We want to be an autonomous community uh, that acts in our own capacity and acts in our own interests. And, and this is one of those sectors that we identified early and we were capable, uh, able, fortunate, able to align ourselves with some great partners uh, who, who brought us along into the industry and we learned a tremendous amount. Uh, and you know now we are starting to drive change and, and it can be frustrating because you know some of the some of the some of the system operator or the government in Ontario, you know, they 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 do things the way they the way they do it because that's the way it's always been done, and, and it's difficult to to pivot them away from you know that thinking. And so, r- rolling out emerging technology is challenging, but we're you know we're making inroads, and I think that you're going to see an electricity grid in Ontario that that's uniquely different in the future that harnesses and mitigates a lot of the lost, lost power that's generated that otherwise could be used for some benefit. And, and Matt, we have a question here, which is what would help on the policy side to, for you guys to scale up uh, and also for other uh, Indigenous uh, peoples to do the same thing as you've done? What, what really yeah. helps on the policy? Well, uh, certainly, you know, the Green Energy Act provided levels of incentives for investment. Um, and so you know, those long-term power purchase agreements that, that provide the bankability uh, uh, for that investment are, are key activating ingredients in my mind. And, and, and you know, in Ontario and other provinces, they've, they've done things like uh, uh, ad, uh, indigenous adders or adders associated with the Aboriginal participation in projects. So if you're over a 10% threshold, you might get a little bit of a kicker on the, on the, on the uh, feed and tariff contract. Those things are really great. I think that uh, one of the other things that Ontario I did right is they, when they rolled out the feed and tariff program, they they uh, included a domestic content rule, which which stimulated job creation in the province, and and that really helped uh, sort of kick off the industry. Of course, there's the ebb and flow and of the politics of things, and you know as renewable energy took took its foothold and wind turbines popped up here and there, um, you know some people ended up with turbine fatigue and, and the politicians reacted and right now there's a lot there seems to be a bit of a pause in in uh, you know further development in the renewable space part of that is because utility bills are not uh are not um are not totally maximized because of the inefficiencies in the grid like i mentioned we need emerging technologies to fill the gaps value. Um, there's other things like uh aboriginal loan guarantee programs or other incentives to provide access to capital for indigenous communities, uh, because those communities, you know, as I mentioned there earlier in my remarks, we w- we were effectively treated as wards of the state. We didn't have an economy, so to go out and raise 50, 60, 70 million dollars to participate in the project is a tall order. And and you know, um, we're not asking for a handout, but you know, a guarantee of some sort or some some assistance uh, to help us be part of the economy. I think is will go will go a long way. Thank you. I will say that's been a key discussion, more about developing countries, but here in Glasgow is this this de-risking of um, private investments uh, through blended finance and other ways to really get money moving where it needs to be. And I'm sure that's the case in Canada, just as it is globally. Tobin, I want to turn to you now. I mean, Germany has for a long time was the the envy of the world in terms of your uh, industrial base. You've got the challenges that you describe, the challenges of transition at present. You've got challenges of very high gas prices, uh, which no doubt are, are causing problems in what's, you know, the steel industry as it still stands now. Um, how do you see policy, the policy mechanisms making what really is a structural transformation of the economy manageable for people even if it's not a it's you know I don't think it's ever going to be a straight line it's too big what we're trying to do to be you know just exactly calm and easy 
But what do you think needs to take place? Well, I think that we really need um, <clears throat> very concrete concepts how to get from A to B and maybe um, um, and really work that out. One thing is setting targets for reducing uh, carbon um, use, and that is perfectly uh, needed to be done. But we also have to work out pathways how to get there. And there we really have to look at the, at the complete um, picture in a way. We need companies that are um, <clears throat> looking at um, some, some, some investment plans and strategies that uh, are sustainable. And uh, this means um, so socially sustainable, um, ecologically sustainable and economically sustainable too. And here we can see that there are, of course, different shareholders um, behaving in a different way. We have shareholders that are looking at a long-term uh, success of a company and others who don't and who are interested in a short-term revenues only. And, and there again, I think it's important that uh, workers having a say in the company, they will always look at the long-term success of a company because they want to keep their jobs. Um, so I think here again, um, workers' voice does play play a role. But of course, we also have to look at the technology side. And there we do not talk only about um, renewable energies. We always have to talk about the digital transformation too. For me, it's a twin transformation, decarbonization and digital tra transformation. Uh, we talked a, a bit about grids and Matt mentioned this. If we want to have um, electricity grids, energy grids that are capable um, of dealing with renewables like wind and solar power, which are much more um, fragile and you have more ups and downs in the systems than you would have from, from um, fuel uh, energy, um, then you need more intelligent grids that are able to, to deal with this. And, and there we need digital solutions. And, and the same is true for um, good public transport systems or transport systems in general, um, that, that we need intelligent um, solutions and that we need also a digital infrastructure. So, um, and we have to be honest, where do we need a step in between? When I look at the steel industry, for example, um, the German companies are now all starting to provide the new um, um, the new plants, new factories uh, with, a, um, <clears throat> with systems that are able to produce steel with hydrogen instead of coal. But we won't have enough hydrogen in the next five years, at least, uh, to power this um, steel plant. So we need gas uh, in between because the technology can be used for gas and hydrogen. Um, so we really have to work out how we want to do this. And we have to do this also, as mentioned before, uh, in the regions. And there, I think what Catherine um, described was very important for me too. And that's what we did in Germany, for example, in the coal regions as well. Really get all stakeholders uh, to the table, um, not only trade unions, but also environmental groups, <clears throat> um, citizens, uh, um, representatives, and really design um, some ideas how future and economic but also social and societal future for a certain re region could look like in these huge changes and develop an idea what is necessary there because i think it's not um, leading to the point if we talk only about some abstract policy goals we need very concrete ideas for regions corporations sectors to develop into a green future thank you i mean you're absolutely right and we have to think about place because replacing one job here with another job here you know, doesn't work for lots of people. But just two quick follow-ups. In terms of the jobs, um, you know, there's, a, there's a caricature of people having nice, well-paid, lots of benefits, um, old industrial jobs, and then the new jobs that are created being service industry jobs or you know, just relatively worse jobs with less security, worse benefits. So that's one question, how do we avoid that? And the second, and the second question is related is, you know, how easy is it for someone who's worked in the steel industry to take on those digital skills. I mean, if, if it's hydrogen uh, powered steel, I can see one could make the shift. But if you're asking someone uh, who's worked in 
the steel industry, all their life to shift. How, how, you know, is it actually possible to retrain people later on in their lives? Have you had success? Does it work? On the second question, I think there have been successes, but there are limits to that, clear limits as well. I mean, you always have to um, take people up where they stand and the qualifications they have and then develop this further. People are not likely to change completely uh, the, the, the jobs and the skills they have. Anyhow, we think it's, it's necessary to make sure that people have the chance to get into a second um, training to 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 achieve uh, new skills and there it's very important um i think not only germany everywhere we can see that the lowest skills uh, are less likely to go into a retraining or an upskilling compared to those that are already higher skilled and we really have to change this and i think in germany a lot of policy instruments already have been developed for this but still this does not solve the problem because if you have low skilled workers who never experienced a good school life or uh, um, had a positive um, um, experience with, with, with training it's very hard to uh, make them move into a, a new training and that's why we developed the model of something like uh, training reps in the companies who really talk to people um, one by one and, and talk about qualification and requalification. So I think there again, we're on a very practical level where we have to convince people, encourage people, and of course, show a clear path where they can um, develop uh, to and into which uh, profession they can develop. And uh, the first question you answered, uh, you, you asked is, is a really tricky one. And I think that the answer is twofold. One is we have to keep or create as much uh, um, new industrial jobs as possible and make sure that they have the same working conditions, wage structure, et cetera, than in the past. And I think this is, cannot only be done by policy. There's a new Tesla plant, which is just being built uh, right uh, in front uh, of the, um, um, or right next to Berlin. And um, this will be a huge struggle for us, making sure that the workers there <clears throat> are also unionized and um, got paid the same wages than in the traditional car uh, factories we see in Germany. So that's an issue for us as well. So I think the, the first part of the answer is making sure that industrial jobs are kept or new industrial jobs are created. But we also have to think about whether it's um, necessarily so that services jobs are paid less and are uh, not accepted as much. I mean, if you look, people working in hospital as nurses, um, this is a hard job. They need a lot of qualification. Um, do we really accept that these um, kind of jobs are not paid as good and the working conditions are worse than in the in traditional industries? So I think we also have to upgrade services jobs um, because there will be some kind of shift from <clears throat> manufacturing jobs to services jobs and so for me, the answer is all, can only be to make sure that also services jobs are paid better and working co conditions are improved. Absolutely the case, thank you. I want to go back to Catherine now and just talk about something that you, you raised twice, which was the, this idea of cultural heritage, heritage and firstly, the idea of validating rather than um, endlessly criticizing people's past. So the celebration of the, um, of the coal mining history and what that contributed to our world before we decided, before we understood that we had to move on from it. And the second piece was obviously you described the, the, the new Louvre in your region. Can you just give us a little bit more of an idea of, of how important those things, those really softer things have been to the success of your efforts? Yes, it's, it's a, one of the core questions we have, uh, because in fact, the, um, we're talking about uh, sometimes stigmatized uh, image of the region, you know, black, black country, uh, low qualified uh, miners, and so on and so on, uh, degraded habitat, housing, and so on. But the image is not uh, only a question of uh, external uh, image, the vision of the press, the vision of the visitors, of uh, but it's also the image of people themselves, of themselves. 
uh, if uh, they uh, uh, have a poor idea of uh, of themselves, you no, know, uh, as low qualified, as uh, no no future people uh, in a, in a city uh, which is you know seen as uh, you know as uh, degraded and so on, they cannot be up to uh, to um, uh, project themselves in a in a in a just transition because they they think that it's unfair, it's unjust, and. Uh, and in fact, they can reject any change or reject uh, uh, or be, in fact, uh, uh, closed, closed down in a ghetto, uh, not moving, not uh, moving in the head, not taking public transportation to, uh, uh, to attain chain jobs or to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to for the needs and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a complex idea. And uh, the idea of an evolving uh, cultural landscape it's uh, really to combine, in fact, uh, the value of a heritage. And I think it's a, really a battle uh, to, to show that this heritage uh, has a value. Uh, in our old countries, uh, you know, a cathedral or a, a palace still has a good, a good, uh, a good image of, of the true heritage, you know, the old stones. But when you, when you, uh, you industrial heritage is a little family in the World Heritage List. Uh, and in the Ruhr, we've got so many uh, good examples with the Zolverein, for instance, which is really a, a magnificent example of a site, World Heritage site. But in fact, the Germans came and said, well, you, you, you chose the evolving cultural landscape. And we're quite interested by this model because it's really to combine the integrity, the protection of, 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 uh, of heritage, but with evolution. The territory is 1.1 million you know, inhabited by people we want, we wish to have them live and work and not to leave the territory, which is a problem too, uh, and to develop qualifications and so, and so on and so on. So the idea is really to say, well, you've got, uh, 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 your house has got a value, uh, a universal value, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, employers' uh, history of uh, housing. Your house has a value, uh, but you can also settle uh, a, a solar panel on the roof, which is really difficult, but you have to combine uh, heritage and, uh, and, uh, and evolution of technologies and so on and so on. But it depends on the way you implant uh, a, 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 panel, a panel solar on your roof, which is really, the, it's uh, uh, the view of a, of a monument of historic and, and uh, architecture. So it is uh, really, how to combine that and really the uh, the heritage uh, label we have world heritage was seen and defined as a, 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 an engine for development for new development so it's to uh, to change you know uh, of course a uh, uh, brownfield into uh, uh, urban parks or in uh, in uh, new in uh, offices in and so on but also to preserve uh, some of these uh, remains which compose really a, a, a complex and organic landscape, and not only one site, but a, a, a series of properties, which is really uh, inspiring for urbanism, for urban planning, for the way of uh, moving also in the territory uh, through the way, uh, railway tracks, the former railway tracks, like in the Ruhr, uh, we transform them into a, a path for pedestrians and uh, and for uh, for buses and so on. So it's a uh, a full new view of uh, considering landscape, uh, heritage, and the link you have to a city quarter, to the way you live. Uh, even, even if your, your house seems humble, it has value, you have a value. And uh, we could measure that uh, to have the Louvre, to have the label, World Heritage label, uh, inhabitants were quite proud uh, uh, of it. Yeah. And I think that is important for, for, for uh, the resilience uh, to have a good idea of uh, where, where you come or the place you live uh, in it. And uh, it's not a true, you. Uh, you know, a dream. It was measured and I think it's a component of a just transition. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the people-centered just transition is very important. In Canada, there's actually a discussion paper out on this. If those people want to, after hearing this, want to get involved, NLCAN has a discussion paper out and a, and a, and a process. I'd love to ask ask many more questions, but I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to thank the French and German embassies, and I, I want to thank our speakers particularly. Uh, and I, I'm going to pass to Toby uh, Heaps, who's also in Glasgow, who's going to round up the session. Toby?
So um, I just I'd like to uh, I, I'm I'm here in Glasgow. I like Diana, a slightly less uh, quiet spot at the moment. I was caught up in a in a protest on the way to a meeting. But I'd like to uh, thank the ambassador, Chris Bell, for the welcome, and to Diana for actually leading the discussion today. And Catherine, and Thorben and Matt, thank you for sharing your concrete ideas and how we can build an inclusive energy transition. We look, we look forward to reconvening the series on November 24th to reflect on some of the outcomes of COP26, which is, uh, we're right in the middle of, uh, I'm right in the middle of at the moment, and what they mean for the just transition. Uh, please join us again and write us at events at corporatenights.com with any feedback or thoughts uh, coming out of this discussion. We look forward to seeing you and uh, stay, stay safe and, and thank you kindly for joining the discussion today. Thanks everyone. We'll let you go now. That was a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.